Good morning, everyone, and greetings to those of you joining us through the, the live feed. Uh, this is week seven of the course, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Lynn Jordy, who is a professor of human genetics at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Jordy's research interests are in the area of gene mapping and in evolutionary genetics. His group is currently analyzing variation in genes in the renin angiotensin pathway with the goal of hoping to better understand uh, the role of these genes in susceptibility to hypertension. And his work also focuses on another, a number of other disorders, such as the genetics of schizophrenia, polycythemia, uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease. The focus of his evolutionary genetics research is on analyzing worldwide genetic variation in human mitochondrial and nuclear DNA, focusing primarily on mobile elements. Uh, the goal of this work is to understand better the geographical origin and migration of man and how these data might be used to determine the relevance of race, race in quotation marks, in biomedical settings, which Dr. Jordi will be talking to a little bit about this morning. Finally, uh, Lynn is one of the most wonderful lecturers that I know, and so I'm very sure that you're going to enjoy today's lecture and learn a lot from him this morning. Uh, so today's lecture, again, is intended to provide you an overview of the field of population genetics, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you once again Dr. Lynn Jordy. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Andy. It's a pleasure to be back here again. So this morning, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to the, to, uh, the field of population genetics. Uh, my talk will be divided into three parts. Uh, we'll talk about patterns of human genetic variation, both among human populations and among individuals, which we can now look at with some precision. We'll talk about the implications of this work for concepts of race, something that is uh, controversial and something that I think is illuminated by our genetic studies. And then finally, in the third part of the talk, we'll discuss how population genetics, evolutionary genetics, uh, informs our understanding of things like linkage to equilibrium, the HAP map, its design, uh, and our continuing search for genes underlying susceptibility to complex disease. So, of course, the story starts with mutation, uh, the generator of genetic variation. Uh, and we estimate, based on phylogenetic analysis, uh, that the human mutation rate is about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8 per base pair per generation. Uh, what that means is that we transmit about 75 or so new DNA variants with each gamete. Now, I should say that some of the uh, new genome analyses of families uh, are suggesting that this rate is overestimated and that the actual mutation rate may be about half of this. So it'll be interesting to see as those studies come out uh, where the uh, mutation rate finally lands. But uh, we think now it might be roughly half of the uh, usually cited phylogenetic estimate. But here's a quote uh, from Lewis Thomas uh, that I like very much. He said, the capacity to blunder slightly is the real marvel of DNA. Without this special attribute, we would still be anaerobic bacteria, and there would be no music. I think that's a lovely quote, and it reminds us of why we should be thankful uh, for our mutations. Well, one of the questions that we can ask as we look at DNA variation in individuals, in populations, in species, is how much at the DNA level do we differ? If we look at aligned DNA-based differences, Identical twins being nature's clones, of course, have, for all intents and purposes, zero DNA sequence differences. A famous figure now uh, is that if we look at any two unrelated humans uh, for aligned DNA base differences, uh, we vary at about only one in 1,000 uh, DNA bases. Uh, several times more than this if you include copy number variants, but for alignable sequence, we are, uh, as it has been said many times now, 99.9% .9 identical. Uh, if we compare ourselves in the same way to our nearest neighbor, the chimp, uh, we differ at about 1 in 100 base pairs from the chimp. So, in a sense, we are 99% chimp. If we compare ourselves to mouse, about 1 in 3 bases uh, differs comparing human and mouse. And fortunately, if we go out substantially <laughs> further, we, we are pretty different from broccoli. But what this means is that given that we have 3 billion DNA base pairs in a haploid genome, that means that there are about 3 million differences 
uh, between each pair of humans. So a tremendous reservoir of genetic variation that accounts for the diversity that we see in a room like this. So we can ask the question, well, how much do populations differ? And that'll be our first, the first area that we look at this morning. Uh, and here uh, we see a map of the world with uh, the populations that I'll be talking about designated. So we've been trying to sample more and more extensively across the world uh, and in collaboration with the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation in Salt Lake City who have collected more than 100,000 DNA samples from all over the world, uh, we've been able to fill in uh, a number of gaps as we look across the world. So I'll be telling you about variation in nearly 1,000 individuals representing 40 human populations. Uh, and really quite a diversity of individuals, either some of the photographs and some of the subjects uh, that I'll be telling you about. So to assess variation in populations, a standard approach is to look at allele frequencies. So if we imagine that we have three SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that we're analyzing in three populations, uh, we can see that there are differences in the frequencies of these three SNPs in populations one, two, and three. And we, we look at those differences, we look at that variation to assess patterns of similarity uh, among populations. Uh, this is one of the very few equations, I think one of two equations I'm going to show you. So I'm, I'm not going to torture you with mathematics this morning. Uh, and this one is pretty simple, but it, uh, it shows how we estimate a statistic called FST. It's very commonly used in population genetics to assess variation between populations. So FST uh, is the amount of genetic variation that is due to population differences. Uh, and we get it by looking at the total heterozygosity, is the total variation across all of our samples, that's H sub T. And from that total, we subtract this quantity, which is the average heterozygosity within each subdivision. So we just look at the heterozygosity within populations, in this case within continents, and we say how much heterozygosity is there on average within our populations, and then we standardize by the total. So if FST is zero, that means that all of the variation that we observe exists within populations. That is, the average within subdivisions is equal to the total. There's no difference between populations. On the other hand, if FST is one, then all of the variation exists between populations. And the only way we could get this would be for H sub S to be zero. In other words, all of our populations, or in this case continents, would consist of identical clones, no variation within subdivisions. So FST of one, maximum variation between subdivisions, FST of zero, none. So if we look at this statistic in a series of polymorphisms, uh, in the samples that I've just been telling you about, if we look at STRs, restriction site polymorphisms, we've also looked at ALU insertion polymorphisms, L1 insertion polymorphisms, and a 250K SNP array, we see that the FST value for our human populations is pretty consistently somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, and this we see in many, many studies of different kinds of DNA polymorphisms, uh, different sets of populations, uh, but typically roughly 10 to 15 percent of genetic variation can be ascribed to differences between these major populations. And that's a relatively small amount, telling us that there isn't that much variation between human populations for these largely neutral DNA variants. Now we can compare that with skin pigmentation, uh, something that has often been used in classifying populations, and we see the opposite pattern. There, 90% of variation exists between populations. Very, very different pattern from what we see when we look at actual DNA variation. So this is, these are traits that have been strongly selected in human populations for difference and divergence. So if we look at just the three original HapMap populations, uh, the European-derived uh, population, CEU, the African YRI, and the two Asian populations, we just look at those, clearly that's a, a limited sample of human diversity. Uh, and it gives us a relatively high FST value, about 15%. 
If we start to sample more populations, FST tends to go down. That is, less variation between populations as we sample more of the world's diversity. So here, looking at 27 populations, FST has gone down to 12%. And here, looking at 40 populations, it goes down to 11%. So the important point here is that as we sample more evenly across the globe, this level of differentiation, the apparent level of differentiation, tends to go down. It's not going to go to zero. Uh, because, of course, there is variation among human populations. But importantly, it can be overestimated if we sample selectively from specific populations. So another way of talking about the extent to which we're similar is to simply ask, well, what proportion of SNPs are shared among populations? And here we're looking at uh, common SNPs from the ENCODE database where the minor allele frequency is greater than 5%. Uh, the important point here is that about 80% of these variants of the minor alleles are shared among the three major continental populations. And fewer than 1% are seen just in Asian populations here, and fewer than 1% are restricted just to European populations. About 6% are specific to African populations, uh, more diversity in Africa and diversity outside of Africa being largely a subset of what we see in Africa. Uh, this uh, paper just came out last week. This was the uh, publication of two complete African genomes. And you can see, again, comparing those genomes. And now we're looking at whole genome sequences. So this includes not just common variants, but also rare variants. And we can see that still, as we're comparing uh, a Yoruban, uh, a Khoisan, an Asian, and a European individual, there's still a lot of sharing of variants among these individuals, even when we're looking at uh, rare variants. Not as much sharing as when we're looking at common variants because the common variants tend to be older. They're more likely to be shared among populations. But still, uh, an, uh, an interesting level of DNA sharing among these individuals for whom we now have complete genome sequence. So how do we actually assess genetic distances, differences between populations? Well, we can use simple genetic distances. Uh, and we define the distance between two populations, call them I and J, uh, by the difference in allele frequencies. So P sub I and P sub J are the allele frequencies in the two populations that we're comparing. So if we go back to those frequencies I showed you a few minutes ago, we have three populations. We're looking at just three SNPs. If we want to assess the distance between populations 1 and 2, we can simply, for uh, this SNP, SNP1, subtract the difference in their frequencies in populations 1 and 2. So that's a very simple genetic distance estimate. And then to get the overall distance between populations 1 and 2, we would just average this distance with the, other, the distances derived from the other two SNPs. So it's really pretty simple. On average, how different are these populations in terms of their allele frequencies? And from that, we can build a network of similarity among populations. So if we have our three populations, we have our distance, P1 minus P2. We can draw a node between those two populations. Then we can take the average of those frequencies, P1 and P2, and subtract that from the frequency in the third population. And that gives us another node in our network. So that's how we can show the similarity of these three populations to one another in terms of their allele frequency similarity. Populations 1 and 2, as you can see just by looking at the frequencies, are a little more similar to each other than they are to population 3. And that's what the network displays for us. So if we do this now uh, for a series of, poly of polymorphisms, now we're looking at ALU insertion polymorphisms. So these are uh, short interspersed nuclear elements that have inserted recently into the human genome, recently enough so that some people will have an ALU at a specific chromosome location, others don't. Then we're assessing the frequencies of those, in this case 100 ALU polymorphisms, some work we did a few years ago, and we're looking at various human populations. You see some interesting patterns here. First of all, you, you see that uh, populations do tend to group together according to their continent of origin. And this isn't really a surprise uh, to a biologist. Populations that live closer together are more likely to exchange mates, are more likely uh, to have common history. So there is a correlation between ancestry and geographic location. So we can see uh, populations from the major continents 
uh, essentially grouping together. Uh, the other thing we notice here is that there's a lot more diversity among the African populations than in the rest of the world, and we'll come back to that. If we assess the statistical significance of these results, these are bootstrap support levels, percentages, and they're very high, telling us that these groupings have substantial statistical support. If we look at a similar network, now based on line one insertion polymorphisms, we see the same pattern. If we look at a network based on 40 populations on a 250K SNP array, Again, we see that same pattern. Here are uh, a series of African populations, European populations, uh, a series from South Asia, East Asia, uh, and the New World over here in yellow. Uh, so these populations do tend to group together according to their geographic location. We've now added uh, to that network uh, the HGDP samples, so another 40 populations, uh, and we see, again, the same pattern. So it's really quite robust. Uh, this is another analysis published in Nature a couple of years ago by another group with a somewhat different sample of populations looking both at CNVs and SNPs. And once again, we see the same pattern. So a reassuring level of consistency across studies. One thing that we notice if we plot haplotype heterozygosity, so we're now looking at haplotypes and we're saying, how much variation in haplotypes is there uh, across the world and as it relates to distance from East Africa? And what we see is that haplotype diversity steadily declines as we go further and further away from Africa. And the pattern is even more apparent if we look just at non-African populations uh, with a very high statistically significant negative correlation. So the further away from Africa we go, the less diversity we see, especially in terms of haplotypes. So all of these bits of evidence are consistent uh, with what I think is now pretty well accepted about uh, modern human origins, that we have a recent common origin in Africa, that human populations first arose in Africa, uh, that is anatomically modern humans, people who look like us, arose roughly 200,000 years ago, stayed in Africa for at least 100,000 years, developed variation as a result of mutation, and then a small subset went out to colonize the rest of the world. Uh, as a result of that, variation in the rest of the world tends to be less than in Africa, and it tends to be a subset of what we see in Africa, all very consistent uh, with the recent African origin of our species and a common origin of our species. Now, this is a, a somewhat different take on human origins. I, I was in the supermarket a few years ago, uh, and uh, well, my eyes were, were caught by this uh, headline, uh, Adam and Eve's skeletons had been stolen. And I, I wasn't even aware that they had been found. Um, but because I was promised more amazing photos inside, uh, I, I, I had to buy it. And what I discovered, <laughs> All that's left is Eve's leg. And uh, the identity of the perpetrator may have been established. <laughs> All right, well, inevitably, if we're talking about differences among populations, among individuals, uh, the, the issue of race comes up. How, what does genetics now tell us about traditional concepts of human race? Uh, I think what you'll see is that uh, our view of race becomes much more nuanced, much more complex, as we begin to look at genetic data. But first we can ask the question, well, why does race even matter? Why does it keep coming up in our discussions? Well, certainly the prevalence of many diseases is known to vary by population uh, and along lines uh, that uh, correspond to traditional racial, racial designations, things like prostate cancer, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and so forth. Uh, we know that some relatively common disease predisposing variants vary among populations. Things like uh, factor five, cl uh, the clotting factor five Leiden variant, uh, substantially more common among Europeans than among other individuals. Uh, there's evidence that response to some drugs may vary among populations. Uh, African Americans may on average be less responsive to ACE inhibitors, based beta blockers for lowering blood pressure. And I emphasize maybe because we're going to come back to that point and what that actually means. 
in the forensic databases uh, that are commonly used by the FBI and by crime labs, they are grouped along traditional, quote, racial lines, uh, Caucasian, I put in quotes, African American, Hispanic, and so forth. So these designations are used commonly in many ways. Uh, the question is, what can genetics tell us about their validity? Well, it's interesting to, to look at some comments over the last decade on race. There was an editorial in the New England Journal uh, a few years ago now uh, that asserted that race is biologically meaningless. Uh, in a response in the New York Times, a psychiatrist, Dr. Sally Sattel, responded, I am a racially profiling doctor, a, a deliberately provocative comment. Her point was that she uses population affiliation in part to help decide dosage and drugs for her patients. A statement a few years ago from the American Anthropological Association said that genetic data show that any two individuals within a particular population are as different genetically as any two people selected from any two populations in the world, which is a fairly bold claim, uh, and uh, we'll see what the genetic data actually do tell us. But I think that when there are so many divergent opinions on an issue, uh, it's time to look at data. Uh, but this, it was interesting to me, that, uh, the uh, headline in uh, uh, the, the cover of Scientific American a few years ago uh, asked, does race exist? Uh, and this, this is the part that uh, caught my attention. Science has the answer. <laughs> now, anytime as a scientist, I think when we, as scientists, when we see that science has the answer, we get a little bit skeptical. But let's, let's look at the data. Well, the way we start is by tabulating DNA sequence differences among individuals. So now instead of looking at populations, we're looking at individuals. And we can pick a few uh, individuals whose DNA sequence we have hypothetically uh, obtained. So we're looking here at George Bush, uh, John McCain, Hillary Clinton, uh, and I just couldn't resist putting in John Edwards. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone wants to share DNA with John Edwards these days, but. Uh, we can compare their sequences. And so as we're, as we're um, making these DNA networks, what we're interested in is sequence difference among our pairs of individuals. And if we compare Bush and McCain, we see that there are two sequence differences between them, two base differences. So we put a two in our little matrix here between Bush and McCain. If we compare Bush and Clinton, we see that there are five differences, so we put a five here. Bush and Edwards, six. Edwards and McCain, four, and so forth. So we make a matrix of DNA differences among our pairs of individuals. And from that, we can make one of these diagrams or trees that shows how similar they are. Uh, this is hypothetical, uh, but uh, it gives you a display then of distances, differences among our pairs of individuals. And you can imagine, if we're, if we're looking at just a few people, we can easily look at the matrix itself and see the pattern. But imagine if we're looking at hundreds or even thousands of individuals, then it becomes much more difficult to deduce a pattern by looking at the matrix of, let's say, a thousand by a thousand individuals. So these displays help us to see the pattern very easily. Now, uh, Steve Guthrie, a gastroenterologist who works with us, a few years ago saw this uh, matrix in the New York Times. It was a matrix of percent disagreement among the nine Supreme Court justices. And he was learning population genetics at the time, and he thought, well, this is a good exercise for building a tree. And if you look at this matrix, you can see some pattern. Uh, you can see, for example, that uh, Justices Thomas and Scalia have only 9% disagreement, so they're pretty similar. But still, it's, it's not so easy to, do, to deduce the whole pattern until you make a diagram, a tree. And then you can see the pattern very, very easily. Uh, we have the conservative wing of the court here, the other wing of the court over here, showing up very nicely uh, on this display. So if we do the same thing uh, for DNA sequence, here we're looking at the angiotensinogen gene, uh, important uh, component of the renin angiotensin pathway. We looked at 14 KB of sequence in that gene, and then we went back and said, well, how similar are the members of these three continental populations, Asians, Europeans, and Africans? And what we see 
is that sometimes an individual from Africa is actually more similar to people from Asia or people from Europe than to others from Africa when we're looking at this single gene, when we're looking at 14 KB of sequence. And what that is reflecting, at least in part, is the mixed ancestry of individuals with regard to specific genes, uh, our complex history of migration and mixing. And we see, when we look at humans, we see genes from Europe and Africa. We see genes from Asia in Europe. So we, do, we humans do have a mixed and very complex history of migration. Uh, there is no such thing as a, quote, pure human population. And the genetic data tell us that very clearly. Now, we may think we've discovered something, but actually Charles Darwin uh, long ago said that it may be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of a race and is constant. So Darwin was well aware of this, uh, that characters that he was looking at tended to vary in frequency among populations, but seldom could you define a population based on any given characteristic. Now, here what we did a few years ago was to look at a larger number of variants. In this case, uh, ALU, STR, and restriction site polymorphisms, material that we had at the time, about uh, close to 200 polymorphisms. And we asked the same question. How similar are these individuals if now, instead of looking at sequence from one gene, we're looking at 190 independent variants? And now we see that there is some pattern here where our samples from Asia tend to group together, from Europe tend to group together, Africa tend to group together. We're using a lot more information. We're picking up more about the ancestries of these individuals. Now, notice also that these branches, most of the branch length is seen within populations. So this is uh, consistent with the FST statistic I, told you, I showed you that said that most of the variation that we see, we see within major populations. But there is enough variation, just enough between populations, so that if we're looking at a lot of characters, we can begin to see a reflection of partial isolation of these populations through their history. So the analogy I like to use is if we're looking at, let's say, height in males and females, and if we only look at height, we're, we're going to see quite a lot of overlap uh, between our male and female populations. But if we add another characteristic, let's say waist-hip ratio, now we have more information that allows us to discern males versus females, uh, and so there's less overlap between them. Well, that's what we're doing as we look at more genetic characters. We're learning more about the ancestries of these individuals. We're starting to see more of the non-overlapping parts of those circles I showed you. So if we do this now with a larger number of characters, here we were using a 10K SNP array, we start to see a pattern in this diagram of individuals. And don't worry about reading the labels. Uh, they correspond to populations. So that if we use a large number of SNPs uh, across the human genome, we start to see individuals sorting according to their population of origin. Now, I should point out, these populations are pretty well separated from each other geographically. Uh, but we do see, for example, African populations here, a European population, South Indian population, uh, South Pacific, New World, Asian, and so forth. So again, telling us that there is some record of ancestry if we look at lots of independent DNA characters. Recently, uh, my colleague, uh, Mark Yandel, in my department, uh, looked at the whole genome sequence data, uh, now publicly available for 10 individuals. And so if we look at whole sequence data, we see that, again, uh, individuals tend to, to sort out according to continent of origin, which is not too surprising. If we can do this with 10K, uh, with 10,000 SNPs, we would expect that if we look at whole sequence data, we're going to see a similar pattern. Now, another thing that Mark found that I think is pretty interesting is that there is some variation depending on the sequencing platform that is used. Because down here, these are the same individual. One and two are the same African sample, uh, but they look rather different depending on whether they were sequenced on an Illumina or an ABI solid platform. In fact, there were 557,000 differences uh, between them generated by differences in platform. So although there is consistency here with ancestry, uh, there is also some platform variation 
uh, that we see uh, in, in our diagram. So you might say, well, what, are, what is whole genome sequence telling us that we can't get with just a sample of SNPs? Well, I want to tell you just, uh, this is uh, 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 a very new study, just came out, uh, where we were able, one of my postdocs was able to use the presence of ALU insertions in whole sequence data uh, to essentially mark regions of the genome uh, that are ancient. So he compared uh, the published uh, NIH sequence uh, with the Venter sequence, HUREF. And the idea here is that if we look at whole sequence variation, uh, the average time uh, to coalescence, that is for any genomic region uh, across these two genomes, they would have a common ancestor about 460,000 years ago. But because ALU insertions are rare events, they only occur in 1 in 20 births, they are like, they tend to be preserved just in very old regions of the genome because they are so rare. In other words, between my brother and me, there's very little chance that we have, that I would have an ALU insertion at a spot on chromosome 5 that he doesn't have. Uh, so because these are rare events, they mark ancient parts of the genome where actually the average coalescence time is about 900,000 years. So for these, for these regions of the genome, uh, regions in which an ALU has inserted, they tend to be very old, we can look at sequence variation in those regions essentially to probe very ancient history uh, in our species and in our ancestors. And what Chad was able to do, and this paper was uh, just published in PNAS in January, was actually to estimate the effective population size of human ancestors 1.2 million years ago. Uh, what's interesting is that that estimate is only about 18,000. In other words, we, at that time, our ancestors, pre-human ancestors, had a very small population size. Uh, and the effective size of anatomically modern humans is also quite small. What that suggests is that our ancestors were fairly close to extinction at one point in their history. And what I find remarkable is that we can learn this and learn, with, learn it with quite a lot of precision from just two human DNA sequences. Because with whole genome sequence, we have a lot of information. Uh, so we can make estimates like this that would be impossible uh, within, without that much information, without that much variation to look at. Uh, so a lot of interesting things that we can do with these whole genome sequences. Uh, and uh, we're very happy that they are publicly available so that we can all look at them uh, and think of interesting things to do with them. So here is another way of looking at genetic distances among populations, uh, at similarities and differences. And this is called a principal components analysis. It's used very commonly in population genetics. Uh, I won't go into details about this, but basically what, what it does is displays differences among our individuals, uh, in, in this case, in three dimensions. So we have a first principal component running this way, a second one running this way, and then a third one, this is kind of the third dimension. Uh, so this is a three-dimensional display of differences and similarities among individuals. Um, the point here is that if we look at only 10 SNPs, if we look at a small collection of variation across the genome, we can't really see much of a pattern. So we don't have very many characters to look at. There's a lot of overlap. If we look at 100 SNPs in the same individuals, the same kind of display, we start to see a little bit of pattern, but there's still a great deal of overlap. There's not really a discernible pattern here in three dimensions. If we look at 1,000 SNPs, we start to see some discernible pattern. And in fact, these groups correspond to the major continent, continental populations. If we look at 250,000 SNPs, uh, there's even more of a pattern, and we can begin to see individuals uh, sorting uh, into populations. These are populations from India here, Asian populations, European, African populations. So again, with lots of information, we can start to see individuals uh, sorting uh, into populations of origin. And I've uh, highlighted the three HapMap populations here to show that they fit essentially where we would expect them to. So if, if you uh, translate uh, these dimensions, 
The first one is sort of a, a Africa versus non-Africa, so this is sort of the out of Africa uh, dimension of this plot. Uh, the second one is uh, pretty much an east-west across the old world, uh, and the third one is a, a, a north-south uh, orientation. So it kind of gives us three dimensions of human genetic variation. Uh, this is a similar uh, plot looking at 850 individuals uh, in two dimensions, uh, and we have essentially a climb here going from west to east. Uh, and again, we see individuals sorting out, but I also want to point out that there is overlap. So we can't, especially now that we're sampling more broadly, we can't draw a, a sharp boundary among these various populations. And that's a very important point. Uh, here we're looking at Eurasia alone, uh, and you start to see essentially a map of the world uh, as you look at these populations, as you look at their genetic similarities uh, for 250,000 SNPs. The important point here, though, is that if we look at multiple polymorphisms, if we look at 10,000 or 100,000 or a million polymorphisms, we can, with some accuracy, predict population affiliation uh, because these SNPs, if there are many of them, are, as I said, telling us about these non-overlapping parts uh, of the circles. But what we can't do, and this is a critical point, we can't go the other way because these SNPs vary in just in frequency among populations. We can't, by looking at a single, by looking at population affiliation, we can't infer what someone's SNP allele is going to be. Or we can't, from a single SNP, infer population affiliation. So that, I think, is a critical point. And that brings us to the question, well, if we have enough genetic information, could we classify everybody uh, into a population? Well, let's look at that network uh, that we viewed just a few minutes ago that showed various human populations. Uh, but let's add a population with a complex history, African Americans. We see that some individuals group into this group down here with people from Africa. Others don't really fall into a group. If we look at Puerto Ricans, another group with a complex history. Some tend to fall in with people from Spain. Others closer to people from Africa. So there are many groups, many human groups, that don't fall neatly into any of these categories. And as we sample them, as we learn more about them, and as human migration continu continues to increase, we'll find that there are a lot of groups, a lot of individuals, uh, that don't fall into any specific group. We have complex ancestries. And that, I think, emphasizes the fallacy of thinking typologically. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I don't use the term race in my own uh, publications, because I think it tends to encourage uh, thinking along the lines of types and typologies, uh, when in fact, uh, as we've seen, most human genetic variation is shared among populations. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, this man, Wayne Joseph, uh, grew up in uh, Louisiana in a Creole family. Uh, what do you think his ancestry is? looking at his appearance. Any guesses about his ancestry? French. <laughs> you can tell this is a trick question, can't you? <laughs> well, he was raised uh, as an African American. Uh, he was a high school principal in California. He sent his DNA off to be tested uh, by a company to find out about his ancestry. Now, I should say that we have to take these ancestry estimates with a grain of salt. There are a number of assumptions involved. Uh, but what he got back was that he was 57% European, 39% Native American, 4% East Asian, uh, and apparently no African genes at all, despite uh, his self-reported ancestry. Uh, he retained his, his culture, of course, uh, but it's interesting to see how one's self-reported ancestry can differ completely uh, from one's DNA-measured ancestry, at least as accurate as that is. And I think this points up uh, a, a very important difference in our discussion about race, the difference between individual ancestry, which can be very complex, and race, which is a very blunt tool. 
uh, an individual, let's say, with 90% African ancestry, 10% European ancestry, would be considered African American in the United States. But also, an individual with only, say, 30 or 40% African ancestry in the United States would likely self-identify as African American, even though their genetic constitution is very, very different. Uh, so that's why I think it's so important uh, to understand this difference between individual ancestry uh, and what we refer to as race. Now, a few months ago, out of curiosity, I sent my DNA uh, into a company uh, to, to uh, learn something about my own ancestry. And, and I was really disappointed. Uh, this is about as boring a genome as you could find, um, according, to, uh, according to the company at least. Uh, my ancestry was 100% European uh, with no interesting variation whatsoever. Uh, my, I should say all of my grandparents came from Norway, but I was hoping there might be some, some rogue genes in there somewhere. <laughs> you can compare me. This is a, a, a woman from the Berber population in North Africa, and a, mu a much more interesting genome. Uh, here we see mostly European ancestry. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, 86 percent. Uh, but some significant African ancestry, a little bit of Asian ancestry, as estimated by the markers used by this company. Uh, the important point here, though, is that sections of this person's chromosome might be of European origin, they might be of African origin. Biomedically significant genes in this person might be of European origin, they might be of African origin. Uh, so once again, ancestry gives us a much more complex view uh, of this person's genetic legacy than does a category like race. Uh, going back to my ancestry, I also uh, did get a report back on my uh, Y chromosome. Uh, and uh, this is a Y chromosome that uh, is pretty common in Northern European, in Northern Europe, a Y haplogroup common in Northern Europe. Uh, and I learned that I share it with Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett. <laughs> uh, hasn't done anything for my singing or my investing. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting factoid. Uh, and uh, I don't have Genghis Khan's uh, Y chromosome. Uh, I don't know that we know what Genghis Khan's Y haplogroup really was. Uh, this is sort of historical um, uh, frolicking, I think. But uh, it is interesting to, to uh, do this sort of recreational genomics. Uh, I also got a report back on my maternal haplogroup, which, not surprisingly, uh, is also common in Europe. Well, what, what did these kinds of patterns imply uh, for biomedicine, for biomedical research? Well, we've seen that if we look at a lot of DNA polymorphisms, uh, we can learn something about ancestry and population history uh, with, I think, some important qualifications uh, that uh, not everyone falls into groups uh, and that there are, of course, assumptions made in making these inferences. But responses for example, to a lot of therapeutic drugs may involve variation in just a few genes, and they are also going to be affected by environment. And what that means uh, is that those genetic classifications don't necessarily tell us that much about biomedically significant phenotypes. Uh, because the genetic variants, as we've said, typically differ just in frequency among populations, and therefore are going to show a lot of sharing, a lot of overlap among populations. And here's a great example. We talked earlier about uh, the effects of ACE inhibitors in African Americans versus European Americans. And this was a meta-analysis published a few years ago looking at the decrease in blood pressure that occurred after administration of ACE inhibitors in thousands of European hypertensives and African American hypertensives. And what we see is that on average, there is about a five millimeter difference in response, that is, African Americans on average don't respond quite as much as European Americans to ACE inhibitors in terms of lowering their blood pressure. But you can also see that there's a lot of overlap uh, between these two curves. A lot of African Americans would actually respond better than a lot of European Americans to an ACE inhibitor. Uh, so once again, using a category like race to predict response gives us some information, but it can also mislead us. Now here's another good example, uh, the drug gefitinib, which is sometimes used to treat non-small cell lung cancer. 
Uh, it's a, um, an EGFR tyrosine kinase, uh, it's, it's an EGFR inhibitor. Uh, it is effective, at least for a while, in about 10% of Europeans, uh, roughly 30% of Asians. So you might be tempted to think, well, we could use population affiliation to help predict who's going to respond uh, to this drug. After all, a threefold difference in different populations. But somatic mutations in EGFR are seen in about 10% of Europeans, about 30% of Japanese patients. And what's really interesting is that 80% of those who have these EGFR mutations respond to gafitinib, and only about 10% without the mutations respond. So we can see that by looking directly at mutations in this gene, we get a much better predictor of response to the drug than if we look at population affiliation. Oh, I'm glad to see my antivirus is working. Okay. Well, and that leads us uh, to a theme that uh, you've heard about and we'll hear more about in this uh, series. Uh, Hal McLeod will talk about personalized medicine and the notion that now that we can look at individual variation, uh, that is a much more appropriate target uh, and a much more appropriate means of deciding therapy once we have the information, once we can make the prediction, uh, than using broad categories like race or population affiliation. So what I've told you about genetic variation and race is that we do see a correlation between geographic location uh, and genetic variation, but that variation, if we sample enough of it, we start to see essentially continuous, non-interrupted variation across space. It's hard to, to delineate specific borders uh, between populations of individuals. And so I think that our traditional concepts of race uh, may not be actually biologically meaningless. That might be an overstatement, but it's biologically very imprecise. It is a blunt tool. Uh, concepts like ancestry looked at at the individual level uh, are certainly going to be more informative, and we hope uh, that personalized medicine, when it becomes a reality, uh, will be medically a lot more useful than categories like ethnicity or race. And I think finally, and this is a point that can't be emphasized enough, there is nothing in genetics uh, that supports racist thinking, thinking that one group is in some way uh, superior to another. And in fact, I think a lot of evidence uh, that contradicts that kind of thinking because we can, we can with genetic data, uh, ascertain how similar we all are to one another, how much variation we do share. So I think actually genetics is an important tool uh, that can help to, co to combat racist thinking. And what I would like to do now, uh, because I think 90 minutes is too long for humans to sit down uh, in one place, I'm going to show you a nice pretty picture uh, taken from just a few miles from my house in Utah. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you to stand up for about a minute or so and just stretch. So you have a little break, and we'll go on to the third part of the talk. This peak is maybe really unique. So our background is not And it's still on just the eight miles. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started again. Hope you enjoyed your break. <laughs> okay, the, uh, in the last part of my talk, um, what I would like to uh, discuss, and you'll be discussing more of this uh, as this series proceeds, uh, is how our understanding of population genetics and evolutionary genetics uh, helps us to understand uh, haplotype distributions, the concept of linkage disequilibrium, and how it helps us to design more effective gene mapping studies. So this is really uh, a bridge uh, between population genetics and evolutionary genetics on the one hand, uh, and gene mapping on the other. Uh, the two have become, I think, really intertwined over the last decade or so. And as somebody with interest in both areas, uh, I've been very gratified uh, to see the mutual interest uh, in both uh, uh, population genetics and uh, gene mapping and location. So. If we look at SNP frequencies uh, across human populations, we find, at least roughly, that a SNP with a minor allele frequency uh, greater than 1% uh, is, 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 occurs about one every 300 base pairs uh, in the genome. Uh, and this depends a little bit on populations you sample and so forth, but at least roughly, we can say that there are at least 10 million, at least 10 million SNPs uh, in the genome uh, where the minor allele frequency is greater than 1%. So they would be considered, under the traditional definition, polymorphisms. A common single nucleotide polymorphism, that is, with a minor allele frequency greater than 5%, uh, we have about 5 million or so of those, at least roughly. Well, that means that at even relatively modest costs, let's say uh, a tenth of a cent per SNP, if we, had to, if we wanted to genotype all five million of those variants, that would cost $5,000 a person. Maybe two or $3,000, but still a lot of money per sample. So if we want to do a case control association study, comparing 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls, and these days this is pretty much a minimum sample size, well, it would cost $10 million to genotype all five million of those SNPs. So this was a real problem. Did we really need to test all of these SNPs in order to assess variation in doing a case control study? And would the SNP association test reveal disease genes? So I want to start with just a couple of uh, very simple definitions because I know we have a, a, a diverse audience here. Uh, so I, I first we'll define a haplotype as the DNA sequence found on one member of a chromosome pair. Uh, so in this individual, we see two haplotypes with these two sets of alleles, big A and little a, and so forth. And we transmit those haplotypes to our offspring. Now, as you know, uh, during meiosis, crossovers can occur between homologous pairs of chromosomes, like this, resulting in recombination of alleles. And now, this parent transmits a new haplotype, a haplotype with a new combination of alleles uh, to his offspring. Uh, so these very fundamental concepts of crossover and recombination, of course, are what allow us uh, to establish the relative distances between loci in the human genome. We can ask how often do these crossovers occur. Well, over time, then, we expect more crossovers uh, between loci that are located further apart. So A and B are further apart. We observe more crossovers between that pair of loci than between B and C. And what that means is that after many generations, we're going to find alleles B and C, that is big B and C, together on the same copy of a chromosome more often than we will find big A and big B because these recombine so that we get little big A with little B and eventually uh, we tend to reassort uh, these alleles due to recombination. And what we're saying is that there is more linkage disequilibrium between this pair of loci than between this pair of loci. That is, the alleles at this pair of loci are found together more frequently than we expect by chance. And that's what we mean by linkage disequilibrium. So here's a, a little diagram 
again illustrating the idea. So linkage disequilibrium, it's the non-random association of alleles at linked loci. At equilibrium, if we have our two loci, A and B, we would expect to see essentially every possible combination, big A and big B, little a and little b, as we look at copies of chromosomes in our population. We can assess the frequencies of those alleles, big A and little a, big B and little b. Uh, and under equilibrium, under linkage equilibrium, we would predict that copies of the chromosome that have big A and big B together should equal the frequencies of those alleles in the population. That is 60% times 40% for 42%. Big A and little b, we should see 60% times 30% or 18% of the time, and so forth. In other words, these loci, their alleles are independent of each other. They're at equilibrium. We can multiply their respective frequencies to get the haplotype frequency. But if we see a substantial deviation from that, as we see in this diagram, where big A and big B are found together on the same copy of a chromosome, that is on the same haplotype, more frequently than we would expect by chance. And big A and, or little a and little b are also found more frequently than we expect by chance. Then we have linkage disequilibrium between A and B. In other words, there haven't been enough recombinations to randomly reassort these alleles in our population. And what that suggests is that A and B are likely fairly close together. So let's imagine how linkage disequilibrium would arise. Let's, let's imagine a cystic fibrosis causing mutation arising some thousands of years ago. This could be the delta F508 common CF causing mutation. And when it first arises, it is going to occur on a specific haplotype background. That is, we see these alleles nearby. Uh, the uppercase alleles would designate then the ancestral chromosome on which that CF mutation first occurred. And so for a few generations, every time we see the CF mutation, we're going to see these alleles nearby. Uh, and these alleles, the alternatives shown here, are not associated with the CF causing mutation. But over time, crossovers are going to occur, breaking up these associations. So on this chromosome, copy in the present day uh, 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 population, we see our CF mutation co-occurring not with big D as it originally did, but with little d. But we still tend to see associations between our mutation and SNPs that are very, very nearby. So we still tend to see uppercase G uh, most of the time when we see our disease causing mutation because it's very, very close, so close that recombination still hasn't had time to reassort our mutation with the alternative allele, little g. And this is what we mean by linkage disequilibrium. And in fact, this approach was used uh, to pinpoint the cystic fibrosis causing gene back in the late 1980s. So there's some advantages in using linkage disequilibrium uh, in mapping disease causing loci. First of all, we don't necessarily have to use family data. Uh, so as opposed to standard linkage analysis, where we look directly at recombinations in families and we have to count recombinations in families, uh, with linkage disequilibrium, this is something we can estimate in populations. And we have, of course, microarray technology now that allows us uh, to look at very dense arrays of SNPs uh, to do our genotyping. And the real advantage of linkage disequilibrium is that it, in essence, incorporates many, many past generations of recombination. Essentially, every recombination that has occurred since the mutation takes, ha, took place. So I like to show this as a contrast. Here we have a series of three generation families that we might use in a standard linkage analysis. We would count recombinations in these families uh, to estimate the distance between loci. But we're limited to the number of generations that we can actually collect. But with linkage disequilibrium, what we're effectively doing is going all the way back to the common ancestor in whom that disease-causing mutation first occurred. And our hope is that in these families, they all share the same disease-causing mutation descended from that common ancestor. And with linkage disequilibrium, we're incorporating the effects of the recombinations that have occurred over many generations. 
since the mutation first occurred. What that means is that linkage disequilibrium can allow us to more finely localize the disease-causing mutation because we have a lot more recombinations effectively to look at uh, and because populations with regard to any specific mutation are essentially one big pedigree, one complicated pedigree tracing back to that original ancestor in whom the mutation first took place. So this linkage disequilibrium has had kind of an interesting history. When I first became interested in it, uh, and I have to admit it was a long time ago, back in about 1982, uh, a guy named David Barker, who was a postdoc of Ray White, uh, came to my office and had four brand new RFLPs. Uh, and back in those days, four new polymorphisms was a big deal. He got the lead article in the American Journal of Human Genetics, that, that uh, issue. Uh, and we were looking at linkage disequilibrium patterns, and that's when I got interested in this phenomenon of linkage disequilibrium, because that it has interesting properties in population genetics. But uh, if you look back at that time, only about 20 articles per year were published on linkage disequilibrium. So you could read a paper every other week and know everything there was to know about this topic. Uh, now, we're up getting close to 2,000 papers a year, you would have to read 30 or 40 papers a week to keep up with that literature. Uh, not that all of them are necessarily worth reading, but this indicates how much interest uh, there is in the topic now of linkage disequilibrium uh, relative to, say, 25 years ago. Well, the question is, is there a simple uniform relationship between physical distance in the genome uh, and linkage disequilibrium between pairs of loci. In other words, if we know the amount of linkage disequilibrium, the amount of non-random association between two loci, how well can we predict how far apart they actually are? So this is the relationship that we would expect, that as distance between loci increases, linkage disequilibrium decreases. It goes eventually to zero. It's often measured with R, uh, a correlation coefficient, so that in complete disequilibrium, that is when we can perfectly predict the allele at one locus, if we know the allele status at a nearby locus, then R is equal to one. If there's no relationship, in other words, if they're under equilibrium, R is equal to zero, there's no correlation. And this is the relationship that we expect. Well, some years ago, we looked at uh, a number of RFLPs near the adenomatous polyposis coli gene, and we were interested in the physical distance between those polymorphisms. So each of these points represents a pair of polymorphisms. And the question was, does disequilibrium between pairs of polymorphisms decrease as we look at polymorphisms that are further and further apart? And here we looked across about 600 KB. And indeed, we did find a significant negative relationship uh, between disequilibrium and distance between these polymorphic markers. And that was an early indication that, well, linkage disequilibrium potentially could be used to finally localize genes on chromosomes. Now here's another example. Uh, this plot, which I, I've reduced to small size, has a series of points here, a series of points here, and then a series of points that doesn't correspond to our relationship at all. So it's not the, the, the uh, decrease, the monotonic decrease in disequilibrium with distance that we would expect. And this was an analysis we did in the neurofibromatosis type 1 region. What we found was that for all of these, loci, all of these markers, all pairs were in substantial disequilibrium with an R value greater than 0.82, but there was another one just uh, 68 KB away from, the, from its nearest neighbor where there was no disequilibrium between it and all of the other markers. So we had a lot of hypotheses at the time uh, to account for this. Uh, it was a GC-rich region. Uh, recombination is somewhat associated uh, with GC content. But what ultimately uh, we learned from the HapMap data is that there is a recombination hotspot right in this area. So the recombination hotspot located right here explains why this polymorphism is not in equilibrium, is not in disequilibrium, even with one that's only 70 KB away. So we don't always see the uniform relationship that we might expect between 
distance, that is physical distance between polymorphisms and the linkage disequilibrium between them. Uh, because among other things, we have hotspots throughout the human genome of recombination. And there are a number of factors uh, that can affect linkage disequilibrium patterns. Chromosome location, uh, recombination is more common near telomeres uh, than elsewhere. Uh, so we tend to see disequilibrium dissipating more quickly uh, in telomeric regions. DNA sequence patterns, GC content, we found that ALU elements influence uh, recombination a little bit and actually increase recombination by a few percent. And of course, there are a lot of ALU elements throughout the human genome. Uh, there are recombination hotspots every 50 to 100 KB. And then what I think is especially interesting uh, is that evolutionary factors influence patterns of linkage disequilibrium in the human genome. Things like natural selection, gene flow, gene conversion, genetic drift, all of the factors that population geneticists, evolutionary geneticists like to think about influence patterns of linkage disequilibrium uh, because disequilibrium reflects the histories of populations and the factors in populations uh, that, have, uh, that have affected genetic variation. So there are some interesting implications of our population genetic studies uh, for disequilibrium patterns. Um, we've seen uh, that uh, cont there is continental variation, even variation within the major continents. That is going to affect stratification patterns uh, and uh, should be taken into account when we're designing uh, uh, case control association studies. Uh, the fact that the African populations were founded further ago in time uh, in other words, they have, we can, we can say, a greater age, uh, implies that we should see less linkage disequilibrium in those populations. That is, uh, there has been more time for recombinations to occur in those populations. Uh, we're going to see linkage disequilibrium persisting over shorter distances because of more recombinations. Uh, we've seen greater divergence of uh, African populations. What that uh, implies is that admic what, what uh, we sometimes call admixture linkage disequilibrium would be especially effective in populations that reflect mixtures of African and non-African populations. Uh, and we don't have time here to talk about admixture disequilibrium, uh, but it's starting to be applied and with some level of success. So here's a way in which uh, population genetics, I think, informs our understanding of haplotype structure uh, and gene mapping. If we think of uh, populations that were founded a long time ago, uh, such as those in Africa, there have been many, many generations for recombinations to occur, uh, as we see here. And that means that we're going to see relatively short groups of haplotypes, or haplotype blocks, as they're sometimes called. In contrast, if we look at a population that was founded relatively recently, uh, an example might be the population of Finland, uh, most of which was founded just a couple thousand years ago. Well, there hasn't been as much time for recombinations to occur in, those po in a population like that, so we have fewer haplotypes in larger blocks. There's more disequilibrium, less haplotype diversity. So if we think about a mutation that may have occurred in that population, couple thousand years ago, it's going to be in disequilibrium with a large number of SNPs. There hasn't been much time for recombination uh, to cause those associations to decay. In contrast, a mutation that occurred in an African population will have had more time during which recombination could reduce its association with nearby SNPs. So we tend to find that mutation in association with a smaller number of SNPs. In other words, we're going to need more SNPs in this population to find associations than in this population. But conversely, in this population, we can more finely map the location of a mutation because it's in association with just a few nearby SNPs. So some important attributes of population history that help to inform us about the design of association studies. And if we look at some real data, uh, this is the kind of display that we get from the uh, program HaploView. 
Uh, and uh, let me explain what, what we're looking at here because we see these all the time uh, in uh, the association study literature. And this is a map of linkage disequilibrium. Each of these little uh, columns here represents a SNP and they are arrayed according to their, their physical location across the chromosome. And then each of these squares, like this red square here, indicates the linkage disequilibrium between a pair of SNPs. So for this adjacent pair of SNPs right here, we have red, we have high disequilibrium. For this pair, that is this one and this one, we have little disequilibrium. So an analogy would be the, the mileage charts that some of, of us have used, where we can take any pair of cities, let's say New York and San Francisco, and we can say, what's the distance between them? Well, here what we're saying is, for a pair of SNPs, what is the disequilibrium between all possible pairs? And the pattern that should really strike you as you look at this is that there is a lot more disequilibrium in this Eurasian sample than in the African sample consistent with this population having been founded much more recently and having less haplotype diversity. We see more disequilibrium. We see SNPs occurring in much larger haplotype blocks in these populations than in these. And that has important implications for, for study design. So I've showed you a few examples of disequilibrium in specific regions, but one of our questions is, well, how general are these patterns? If we look across the genome, what kinds of patterns do we see? Uh, and back about 10 years ago, our knowledge of the human genome, the, of linkage disequilibrium across the human genome, was a lot like this map of the world from 1544. We really didn't know much about patterns of disequilibrium or haplotype structure across the genome. And if you look at this map, we have a uh, you know, fairly good representation of Europe, some of Africa and Asia. You see that North America is completely absent uh, in 1544. Well, that's kind of how our knowledge of haplotype structure across the genome was roughly 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and that's what led to the HapMap project. Um, and I want to mention this. You'll hear more about it uh, in other lectures as well. Uh, but the original idea was to look at a large collection of SNPs uh, 600,000, it eventually went to a million, and then more after that, uh, in individuals from three major populations. 90 of them in uh, 30 trios were from the uh, Utah Ceph collection, so this represented Northern Europe, uh, 90 Yoruban, and 90 East Asian individuals. And the idea was to look at patterns of linkage disequilibrium in these different populations uh, and to look at haplotype structure to see to what extent these vary among populations and across the genome. And there were some interesting issues that came up in the early discussions uh, of the HapMap, and uh, I was lucky enough to be part of those discussions. Uh, one of the uh, issues was how best to sample human diversity if you can only sample a few populations. And the decision was to try to look at a fairly broad sampling, but by no means a complete sampling of human diversity. And of course, there were sample size issues, statistical power issues, issues involving uh, SNP ascertainment and density, and then also uh, uh, a number of ethical, legal, social issues, things like informed consent. There was even some discussion of whether we should name the populations or not, or whether the three populations should not be identified uh, because of concerns about potential stigmatization. Uh, the population geneticists felt that because we know that population history affects haplotype structure and disequilibrium, if we don't name the populations, then we don't know their histories, uh, that would be a severe liability. Uh, so for that reason, uh, it was decided, we did decide uh, to uh, name the populations, and I think that's added a lot of usefulness and information to the HapMap samples. And subsequent to that, I think our map of the world improved. Our map of the genome, our map of haplotype structure uh, improved uh, quite a lot. As you can see, um, California, for some reason, is still missing from this map. Uh, but by and large, our knowledge of the human genome improved, uh, our, our knowledge of disequilibrium in the genome improved a great deal. And there have been a number of interesting applications uh, of the HapMap. First of all, understanding uh, worldwide, uh, genome-wide patterns of haplotype diversity detecting recombination hotspots throughout the genome, 
uh, detec detection of genes that have experienced natural selection, uh, and then, of course, detection of disease-causing mutations. So here's an example looking at the decay of disequilibrium uh, across genomic regions uh, in the HapMap populations, the Asian, European, African populations, and you can see that, as we would expect, with more recombinations, disequil disequilibrium decays more quickly with physical distance in the African population, in the Yorban population, and in this isolate population, more recently founded, we see that disequilibrium doesn't decay quite as rapidly. Uh, again, more recent history, fewer recombinations, more linkage disequilibrium. Uh, so we start to get a picture uh, of patterns of disequilibrium across the world with these data. Uh, and one of the really important consequences of HapMap uh, is that uh, we've learned that because of the pattern of disequilibrium across the genome, uh, a lot of SNPs are effectively redundant. If we know that this person has a C at this position, they have a T at another position, an A at another position because of linkage disequilibrium. Whereas person B here has an A at this position, a G here, and a C here. And what that tells us is that we only need to type this one in order to know the genotypes of these. In other words, we don't have to type all 5 million common SNPs. We can t type a subset of them, what we call tagging SNPs, and get a pretty good picture of the diversity across the genome by looking at that subset of variation. And that in itself is a huge saving of money. The fact that we can type maybe a million SNPs in non-African populations and essentially get the haplotype diversity across the genome instead of typing all 5 million uh, is a huge savings in money. And we find, uh, and a number of studies have looked at the portability of the HapMap tagging SNPs across populations, and we find that in general they are pretty portable. That is, you can infer patterns of disequilibrium uh, from one major population within a continent to another, and most of the time get it right. We've also been able to detect the presence of recombination hotspots by looking at regions where disequilibrium suddenly declines. And we define a recombination hotspot as a 1 to 2 kb region where recombination is elevated tenfold above background. And it's been quite interesting uh, to discover uh, that uh, there are tens of thousands of hotspots in the human genome, roughly one every 50 to 100 kb. Uh, we recently looked at uh, a family, uh, two parents, two offspring, looked at their whole genome sequence, found 155 recombinations, uh, 92 of them were in recombination hotspots. Uh, so uh, in general, the data tell us that most crossovers, at least 60%, occur in only about 10% of the genome. So uh, hotspots really are significant uh, in terms of accounting for most crossovers. And another really interesting finding from these studies of recombination hotspots is that they are not at all congruent in human and chimp. Even though our DNA sequence is 99% the same, our hotspots are very, very different, suggesting that these evolve very rapidly. They may not be sequence dependent. They may involve epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, so all kinds of interesting questions uh, that can be addressed with data uh, such as those of the HapMap. Now, another thing uh, that these data allow us to do is to detect natural selection in the genome. And this slide sketches out how we do that. So imagine that a, disease, that a, 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 a variant of interest has occurred, and as we saw, it occurs on a specific chromosome background, so we will see it at first in association uh, with nearby SNPs. But of course, when it first occurs, its allele frequency over here is very low. Uh, if it's a neutral variant, it may rise in frequency through time as a result of genetic drift, but that increase in frequency is going to be very slow. And what happens as this variant, the red star, increases in frequency through time is that because of recombination, it is associated with fewer and fewer nearby SNPs through time. That is, we're going to see very little disequilibrium between this variant and, let's say, this SNP once the variant gets to, let's say, 10% in frequency. 
But if it's under selection, if there's been recent positive selection for that variant, let's say it confers some sort of adaptive advantage, it will rise quickly to high frequency, let's say 10 or 12%. And because of selection, because selection has caused it to rise in frequency very quickly, it will still be in disequilibrium with many nearby SNPs. We'll have a very long range of, of li linkage disequilibrium around that variant. And we will see that when we look at genomic data. We'll see a region in which there's high disequilibrium over an unexpectedly large distance. And this is a, sign a signature of strong positive selection on this variant. That is, that the variant has risen to high frequency and is in a large linkage disequilibrium block. And this approach has been used uh, to detect natural selection uh, involving a number of phenotypes, uh, malaria resistance, hemochromatosis, sodium retention, uh, lactose, hereditary uh, lactase persistence, several genes for skin pigmentation, and so forth. Uh, so another interesting application of these data, finding regions that have been strongly affected by positive selection in human populations. And of course, Linkage disequilibrium has had uh, some real successes in localizing single gene disorders. That is where they were, the uh, loci were first mapped roughly by using linkage analysis, but then the disease causing gene was found using linkage disequilibrium analysis uh, to pinpoint the actual gene. And my display has just frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, these kinds of studies uh, are very successful if, we, if, we, if most cases of the disease are caused by a single mutation. That makes sense. If uh, this mutation is the only one or the principal one that causes disease, then we're going to be able to easily detect association between the disease phenotype, and nearby SNPs. But imagine if instead we have multiple disease-causing mutations. Then sometimes we're going to see the disease when we see uh, one genotype, sometimes a different genotype. Uh, so when there are multiple disease-causing mutations, when there is a substantial allelic heterogeneity, that presents real challenges in doing case control association studies. So one of our issues is how can we reduce that heterogeneity and enhance the genetic signal? Well, clearly, uh, consistent trait definition, uh, the use of intermediate phenotypes, will help to decrease heterogeneity. We can identify subtypes of disease, those with early onset, atypical expression, severe expression. And this is where clinicians uh, can be especially helpful because typically the clinicians understand those subtypes and can inform the geneticist as to which group of cases should be used in an association study. And we can use our knowledge of evolutionary history uh, to define populations in a very uh, strict and narrow fashion so that we have as uniform a, uh, an evolutionary history as possible. And there may be situations in which population isolates will be of special utility. Uh, so the bottom line is, and some of you have probably seen these kinds of displays before, uh, we can now point to quite a few uh, genome-wide association studies that have been successful in uncovering uh, susceptibility variants for common complex disease. Uh, as you know, there's still a lot left to be discovered. Most of the heritability remains to be discovered, uh, but because of, I think, intelligent study design, much of it informed by our knowledge of population genetics, uh, these kinds of studies have been much, much more successful over the last couple of years uh, than previously. And this is something else that you will hear about. I think Karen Mulkey will be talking about this uh, later in this series. So uh, to summarize uh, what I've told you this morning, uh, we see that uh, genetic variation, when we look at uh, SNP microarrays, or now as we're starting to look at whole genome sequence, uh, it does contain useful information about our population history, about our ancestry. 
I think that our studies of genetic variation give us a more informed, a more nuanced view of the concept of race uh, and tell us uh, much more about medical relevance uh, than if we use uh, these broad categories like population affiliation or race. Uh, and population genetic analysis, especially in the context of linkage disequilibrium, uh, has played a central role uh, in understanding linkage disequilibrium and how it is applied uh, to mapping and localizing disease-causing genes. And finally, I hope you've gotten some sense of something that not everyone appreciates. Population genetics can actually be fun. It can tell us interesting things, fun things about ourselves, our populations, uh, and even about our, um, our phenotypes in general. So finally, I want to acknowledge uh, a number of my colleagues at the University of Utah, uh, people in my lab and other colleagues who have contributed to the work I've told you about, uh, the mobile element work that I touched on just a little bit, I've done in collaboration over uh, many years now with my colleague at LSU, Mark Batzer. Uh, some of the samples that I told you about uh, were gathered uh, by the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation, uh, Scott Woodward and Edgar Gomez in particular, uh, and that I think is helping to, uh, to increase our knowledge of genetic variation. So I want to thank uh, all of these uh, people for their contribution uh, to our research, and I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. And I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Okay, I'm just told that uh, usually we don't have questions at these, so uh, don't I'll, feel I'll, I'll ask one. Okay. So this you know, field of uh, analyzing linkage disequilibrium, does it work for very, very rare mutations? I mean, I, I, conceive that it'd have to be pretty common to actually work. Yeah. It, it could potentially work for a rare mutation. The problem is that you need a fairly large sample size right. of affected individuals right. who are unrelated, at least right. not closely related. And if you've got a really rare mutation, it might be very difficult uh, to get a large enough sample, say 50 to 100 cases. Right. So that, that, that's, that's where it uh, would be uh, and challenging. Also, there are like, a lot of disease classes that are caused by multiple different type of mutations, like cardiomyopathies for one. Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't it be difficult to use linkage disequilibrium in, in such a case? Yeah, if, yeah, if, there, if there's substantial allelic heterogeneity, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at, say, BRCA1, right. where there are hundreds of different mutations, well, each of those mutations occurs on a different haplotype background, so you're not going to see a consistent pattern of association. So right. yeah, if there's, if there's strong allelic he heterogeneity, uh, linkage disequilibrium becomes, it, it can, it, 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 it isn't always very useful. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Has anyone applied phylogenetics to SNPs? Phylogenetics to SNPs? Uh huh. Yes. There are. Are, are they, are the, the results uh, meaningful or what? Yeah, uh, the, the results that we see. Now, are you talking about phylogenetics across species? Uh, or, or within species? Within species, within um, Yeah, population. so if we look at, at, yeah. at patterns in humans, uh, they're very consistent with what we've seen with other markers, what we see with whole sequence. Uh, essentially, every, every kind of polymorphism we look at, at least for autosomal polymorphisms, gives us a pretty similar pattern phylogenetically. All right, thank you.